So good afternoon, uh, everybody, or whatever time it is where you are around the world. Uh, welcome to the 57th meeting, uh, monthly meeting of the Strongly Sustainable Business Model Group. Uh, this meeting is being recorded, so if you do not wish to be recorded, please leave now. Um, this month, we're very fortunate to have with us uh, two world leaders in the field of measuring strong sustainability. Uh, Dr. Jeff Kendall, who is in Boston, Today, uh, normally from the UK, and Dr. Bob Willem, who is from just down the lake from us here in Toronto, in Whitby, Ontario. Uh, and uh, we have in the room with us here in uh, Toronto uh, a bunch of folks, about how many are we? Six of us. Uh, and we have another six or seven of us online from various parts. Um, the list of people who is here is in the Wiki page, which is the first link in the chat, if you want to find out who's here. And anybody who would like their name added, uh, for posterity, please name and affiliation in the chat, and I will add it as the presentation unfolds. Uh, so, with that, uh, I will turn it over to Bob, who I think is going to off, and then uh, hand it over to Jeff at some point, and you can tell everybody how you'd like to take it. As you uh, Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm going to talk for about 20 minutes about what's going on with this latest book, or the latest incarnation of the business case. Then I'll uh, open up for questions if you have any. And then we'll turn it over to Jeff, and he will do the same as an update on where we are in the future of the benchmark. And also we'll open it up for questions. So, uh, looking forward to the interchange. So uh, as you can see from the slide, um, this is the third incarnation of the business case that I have undertaken. The first one was called the Sustainability Advantage. The second one was called the New Sustainability Advantage. And this is called the Sustainability Advantage Alt Book, which is short for Ultimate Workbook, which I've had the audacity to call this, saying that it is the, uh, the pulling together of the best of about 16 different frameworks out there on how to articulate a business case for sustainability initiatives. As you can see from the yellow on the cover, uh, it's going to be a free open source resource available to anybody that wants to use it. And uh, it's currently in a, in a draft form, uh, which was unveiled last November, and I'm continuously updating that with feedback from folks that review. And it'll be finalized for uh, a sustainable brands conference in May. So it's still a work in progress, but it's getting very close to the minute final form. Um, one of the questions is why? Why another incarnation of this? And there was a report that came out last month that kind of reinforces the need for better articulation of the case. There was a report put together by an organization called Bain and Company, and it took a look at uh, sustainability initiatives that about 300 companies have been undertaking, and it did a, an assessment of how things are going. And as you can see, not very well. Um, most of the initiatives that you and I would call sustainability initiatives are not very successful. Uh, so the report was good enough to dive into why not. And it turns out that there's a lack of senior leaders support, a lack of resources being provided to the people who are taking these initiatives, a lack of employee engagement, some iffy kind of metrics and things like that. And the report concluded with some guidance guidelines for what it is that needs to be done to improve the track record of the sustainability As you might expect, uh, trying to get folks to live up to public commitments, of course, would be one way of improving the track record and leading by example at the executive level. But the one that caught my eye was highlighting the business case because they're not going to make a public commitment or lead by example unless they can see that there's something in it for the company, something that requires them to make this a priority, or they will be able to get the benefits. Um, and if they get the benefits, then they will hardwire the changes into the process of the organization. So it was just another reminder that one of the reasons that we're having difficulty in the ability to traction is that maybe we're not as proficient at articulating our business cases could be. Essentially what we're talking about here is uh, being smarter about the justifications that are usually used for a business doing anything. Uh, the first one is do the right thing. It's the right thing to do. It's aligned with the purpose of the company. 
And for most of us in the sustainability arena, that's been the one that we've really focused on, that do the right thing for the environment and society, and imply strongly that that will be good for the business. However, most business folks require something that's more specific as to what opportunities they could capture if they cleaned up their act, and also risk that they could avoid uh, if they were not to do anything. So those are the big three justifications. Uh, they apply to any business decision, but they especially apply to sustainability. So what we're really talking about here is being able to recast all of the kind of knowledge and benefits that sustainability people have with the lens on the company that business people have. So basically taking the science and sustainability literacy that we bring to the table, and making sure that that resonates or connects with the business and accounting literacy that business leaders also bring to the table. Using the framework that you see in the middle, we may be able to bridge those gaps. Um, some sustainability folks kind of resist the fact that this is a necessity, a requirement. Uh, but I think if we're going to get the traction that we need, uh, we're going to have to step up to this and use frameworks that are more comfortable for people to look at. The last incarnation of the business case that was in the new sustainability advantage. Uh, contains some of those elements, particularly the last two, capturing opportunities and mitigating risks of action. Uh, it showed that the company could grow its revenue in three different ways, that it could save on five different kinds of operational expenses and a couple of HR expenses as well. Uh, it could improve mm -hmm. its reputation by doing so. Uh, that would create some revenue growth, so it contributes to revenue growth. It might be able to attract top talent that are interested in working for that kind of company. So. HR benefits as well. Um, and if the company simply used best practices uh, to do all of that, there's a huge opportunity for them to save enough revenue and save enough, grow the revenue enough and save enough expenses that their profit would go up substantially. In fact, for typical companies, it would go up by 51 to 81 percent, and they could avoid an erosion of their profit if they were not to do anything. That and that's looking at two different kinds of companies. All of that was articulated in that. You can also squirrel some money away in a sustainability capital reserve, so it could be a self-funding kind of thing. And it was a pretty compelling business case. So just by doing what other companies have already done, it could be it could be pretty pretty compelling. However, um, there seem to be some things that executives are looking for that were not explicitly covered in the formulation of the book and the worksheets. And that's what I'm trying to fix in the next version. So the next version, the ultimate workbook, has the same things. It's a little bit more on the operational expense savings. So there are 12 different kinds of expenses that a company could reduce stepped up to their environmental and social challenges appropriately. Um, and they therefore could improve their profits potentially. Notice that reputation is in a dotted line, box of innovation as well. Um, and that's to indicate that it's hard to quantify them by themselves. They definitely are contributors to the others. So reputation with customers would drive revenue growth. Reputation with employees would increase Activity. So, uh, in addition, uh, companies very often, when they're trying to make a decision on an initiative, want to know what the ROI. So, the new incarnation spends uh, a little bit more time, a little bit more effort in helping with what the return on investment might be. Takes a look at a five year cash flow with the benefits and uh, whatever expenses there might be. The net present value calculation on that also takes a look at the internal rate of return that they're going to get from the money they put in the first place, and does a calculation on whether or not it fits the payback period norms of the company. Um, so that is a huge uh, value add to the new incarnation of the case because it's a question of 
or the like. Confused. A couple of other areas that are included in this one, uh, whether or not the assets that they have might be advanced, the value of those assets, so that could have a positive impact on the balance sheet. So if they retrofitted the building, the value of that building might be higher as an asset. Uh, it could be that if they uh, clean up their act, especially on carbon, uh, the stock market might reward them by giving them a bit of a boost in their share price relative to other companies. Yet in that, there'd be some there that we can quantify. Uh, as well as the icing on the cake, which all of these things uh, would also reinforce, and that is that they are essentially fulfilling their purpose, uh, which appeals to that other justification. So the sustainability advantage health book includes all of those the calculations or the user, but it includes all of the line items that those 16 other frameworks um, also had. So I, I think it's it's pretty comprehensive. That's the good news. The bad news is it's pretty comprehensive. It's a challenge to using it. Um, it's a collection of work books or worksheets or business cases. Because there are really five different kinds of initiatives that a company might undertake, and each of them have the same line items, but there's different items that they take advantage of. So the, the five different categories of initiatives that companies might undertake, two of which are environmental, social, here, and baked into the spreadsheet, a lot of items as well might be possible and that guidance is um, relevant to the kind of initiative that they're undertaking. The guidance is tailored to the kind of initiative. So there's a lot of guidance. In fact, the book, I forgot to mention this, the book is not written as a book. The book is written as an Excel workbook. The book is written in Excel. Um, which is a little unusual. But it's intended to be a fill in the blanks work, work with guidance that pops up with comments associated with some of the help. So that's what the intent is. And the intent is really to try to overcome the pathetic track record that we've had about the initiatives and to tell executives in a way uh, on the fact that what we're suggesting that we should take is not only good for the environment, but good for society. Really good. And frankly, if the business case doesn't look that good, or maybe the company should not undertake it. Because we're going to get off to a false start, the executives will lose interest, people will be pissed off, their layer of cynicism, cynicism will grow. Actually, so we want you to be careful if we're going to do something, let's do it. And it doesn't look like So um, I think this is going to be a useful tool, helping to overcome some of that baited company findings. So here is my vision and goal for this. Um, I'd really like to get it to the point that executives want, voluntarily want, to improve their sustainability performance as quickly as possible because it is not only good for the environment and society, but it's good for business. So answering the why question. The goal that I have is to try to get this out there as quickly and as completely as possible to all the people who are trying to engage in their journeys. I think this has got a lot of elements in it that are going to be very useful to sustainability champions, which is why I'm calling it Army Night, because it forces them to articulate exactly what their initiative is going to do, what it's going to cost, how the benefits are going to be realized over time. Um, and it also shows the so what of that in terms of understand in terms of financial benefits. So that's the goal. So I've got four strategies. But one is just put it on our website <laughs> and uh, wait for people to download it. A couple hundred people have already done that. Um, but I don't think that's going to do it. 
So I'm working with the, the CPA Canada folks at WWF Canada uh, on workshops that would combine uh, accounting types, CPA types with CPA folks and get them comfortable using that tool. And um, I think that's going to generate some interest, at least in Canada, around that. I also uh, am planning at the Sustainable Brands um, a meeting coming up in Detroit to do a workshop to help others uh, get their heads around this and perhaps have Sustainable Brands help those folks use it as a tool uh, afterwards and provide a value add service to their members that way. Um, and also, as you can see, there's a whole bunch of other resources out there that are available to sustainability champions and there may be an opportunity to integrate some elements of this database into them. So the Strong Sustainable Business Model Group, um, when we look at the metrics associated with the canvas, there may be an opportunity to bring in some of the ideas from this uh, business case in the way in which they're calculated and tracked. Uh, the Future Fit Business Benchmark, uh, which is for the larger companies as well, uh, when we get pushback from organizations on why would we bought it. Uh, there may be some, some opportunities to use some logic and tool. Uh, B Lab, why they come a B Corp, same kind of thing. Um, SDG Compass, so as you know, the Sustainable Development Goals from the UN, there's a group working on business efforts to try to live up to those. And they have tools for businesses that might be appropriate. Uh, the natural step is setting up an academy for advisors, uh, just like a tool for that as well, ISS. Or for the, that's the International Society of Sustainable Professionals uh, that I'm a member of, and I um, that has a reservoir of tools for future engineering project uh, MBA schools. <laughs> so there are a lot of different uh, opportunities to channels to get this out there. Um, but I welcome your thoughts on. Other ways to at least make people aware of this so that they can decide whether it's uh, a useful thing for them to um, use in whatever it is they're doing with their business. This is the interactive part. <laughs> <laughs> that, was the, that was the dramatic pause. Right. Yeah. Questions? Go ahead. Well, I think. Um, you know, you've got a whole list there. I'm wondering whether you could augment this business that at all touching on sustainability. And, and not only business. So MBA meant MBA schools or business schools, but more specifically, maybe through the net impact uh, chapters and, and many of those, mm -hmm. they would be interested in school. I did run a workshop for the um, net impact group up at the Schulich School. It seemed to work pretty well. Uh, so I think they're a group that might find this a good idea. Then it is systematically we are top So but the one time workshop will reach a number of people but then it's sort of gone to the the faculty more than one That's a good reminder. I've got connections with a fair number of MBA schools because uh, I do a lot of webinars to them. Um, so I should exploit those better. You're right. Other thoughts? The, the um, CPA angle is really interesting. Um, I mean, they are the professional advisors to the decision makers that you want to reach, whether they're inside those organizations or working for them. Um, 
those organizations. Um, one might hope that the professional associations can make a mandatory part of um, certification training. Um, as you know, the, the, to make sure that their managers are equipped for the world that it's involving. I think that the professional industry ought, ought to have an understanding of stuff that to, to make it in. Does the CPA have a CPA system? Yes, and we're going to be experimenting, um, maybe not at the Sustainable Brands event in uh, Detroit in May, but there's another event coming up in the fall in Philadelphia. And there are a couple of CPA, state level CPA organizations in the US, um, Minnesota, and Rhode Island, um, that are toying with the idea of offering credits to their CPAs if they were to attend. But I agree, there's huge leverage there, especially if you can somehow get through the armor in that organization. One of the challenges there, Bob, is that any of those organizations, talking about the collective credits, their corresponding management consulting divisions have their own sustainability offerings. And this is really the, the Trojan horse that I hope to get into some of those because it's free and it's open source and they can re-swizzle, recolor, reorganize, reword all of this stuff uh, in a way that is consistent with whatever else they offer and make it their own. Um, yeah. So that, that's really what I'm hoping that they'll take it and, and re, re, uh, reconfigure it so that it's more consistent with how they would normally this to me is a base business case from which the dream is people will create their own versions that are more specific to perhaps a sector um, or a technology or uh, translated into different languages. I don't care. But the objective, as you can see, the vision is yeah. to get everybody out there, businesses on board, because really they're using this it's Relevant. So, so that's, so, an, that's antithetical to their to their proprietary methods. You come in saying, "Hey, I've got I've got a method you're welcome to take. You can white label. You can relabel as you want." And that's antithetical to their anti mining. Well, it is. It's hard to. I think it is a white label. It's hard to sell it, but I, I think that there are people within those. Those practices that they get it uh, and trust it and go for it. Yeah. Is there something that you have a, you know, uh, it's, it's going to be one of the, the situations where if you crack one, yeah. you'll crack major. Yeah, if you right. crack a major like a PWC or Deloitte or whoever it might be. Yeah, the PwC and Deloitte contracts that I've had are both moved on. I'm meeting with a couple of CPA tomorrow. Um, the other thing there is uh, you need to create a bus. The bus is usually these days. So it can be organized, but it's not like here right now. It's really can be organized across different channels. So that everybody starts talking about it. You hear about that actually. Okay. Yeah. So it becomes, you know, sort of a interesting <coughs> for the younger generation within the company. They can then take it and, and they realize, hey, I can make very good proposals, you know, of my own and shine in my company because I'm doing savings or anything. Isn't that but the, but the bus can have sometimes more effect than through the traditional aspect. So I need some early adopters that have used it and are credible spokespeople to say, you know, this really was helpful for us. Um, there may be some of the current users that would be candidates for that, um, but keeping track of who they are and the organization. Um, but 
I, I, I need to be smarter. Right. Need some younger allies. Yeah. Because what happens at times, they just talk about it, not necessarily all of them use it. But by a lot of people talking about it, it goes over and deep. And suddenly it becomes a thing, so everybody's doing it. Talking about it, right? You need the exposure. You need to attract people who look at it. People who look at it for a variety of reasons. But first, you need to create that. That was for whatever reason first book. Some younger people how to mount it. Some case usefulness of the tool like existing technology. So maybe all those advocating digital things or the industry that is around it. Use these and maybe customize it version of it and see the changes. Selling TV. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All these people kind of need like that specific one. The specific one, so you have like the, uh, the worksheet that is by different regulations. So, I'm, I'm reminded of the uh, advice that I gave a number of us back in October, September last year about. Um, it's of course useful to everybody because it's generic, which means that it, nobody thinks it's useful for them. So they're not looking for generic solution. Uh, uh, so it's, it's how you. Um, uh, Jeff, are you having problems hearing us? This is odd. We, we typically don't have a problem with the mics in the room. Can you hear us, uh, Jeff? Yeah, Last when. Week. Bob, when you or Anthony speak, it's perfect. When anyone else speaks, I can barely hear. I think maybe the mic just is not hitting the threshold necessary because people are further away, possibly. It's OK. They're more directional, I think, than, than we realize. So there are two microphones hanging from the ceiling. and uh, Oh, I see. OK. They're picking us up because they're pointed towards us. How about this guy? Is that any better? Yeah, that's perfect. Um, <laughs> Downloads and going for two million. Um, 
so that we get it at their class. And then people can decide whether they're going to use it or not, but I want to make sure they at least are aware of it as a potential. Randy said association of change. Oh, okay. Thank you, Randy. Um, All right. Uh, Jeff, you're wrestling with some of the same things as a free open source resource hell, right? So uh, why don't we bridge from my talk over to yours and you can give people an update on where we are with the release two of future business and benchmark. Yeah, actually, um, just a couple of quick thoughts on that before we go, Bob, the old book stuff. Um, anyone who hasn't looked at it, definitely go and look. I think it's great the way Bob has put this into like functionally separate areas. We often fall into the trap in this space of talking about the business case for sustainability as some kind of amorphous blob of what's the business case of doing the right thing. And Bob's avoided that by like focusing this on particular types of initiative with particular types of input and output. And I think that's really helpful. And in terms of early adopters, Bob, I think it's like who is whose pain does this remove? And for me, there are probably two people, types of people. There's the sustainability people in their companies who are struggling to get other people to pay attention to the things that they need to do. And they know that needs to happen. And, and they often don't have a very strong uh, background in the core business. Um, they're seen as more of a side thing, a necessary evil of reporting and all that kind of stuff. So those people who really know what needs to happen and what the company could do and being able to have a conversation around the numbers with the CFO and, and others and you know get them in the room in the first place. And the other is the angle you're pushing with the CPA, which I think is specifically which um, people within that membership are working within organizations and facing the opposite problem. They're having sustainability teams come to them with half-baked ideas about what needs to happen without actually going through the rigor of putting numbers around it. And for them to be able to give them this and hand it to those sustainability people and say, okay, look, let's, let's work through this together, I think is, is great. And when you get two or three examples um, that you can then put up there for everybody to use, I, th I think it's going to start a snowball effect. Thank you. And um, Brandon said that uh, his next refocus right. session, uh, uh, I don't know if there is one, but a program image might be another. Yeah. It's, it's also, for anyone who hasn't seen it yet, it is also really underselling it to say this is a spreadsheet. Bob has made Excel do things that I never thought Excel could do. <laughs> it's, it really is like the amount of like you know graphics in there and the narrative that leads you through and stuff. You know, it's it's, it's brilliant. So uh, yeah, definitely go and check it out. That by itself should appear to the CPAs. Yeah. <laughs> by the way, the idea of having five rather than one was actually Jeff and his colleague Astrid's suggestion, which I fought initially, but. Um, as soon as I tried it, I thought, this makes it so much better. Um, as I bounce this uh, idea off people, the, the value of the feedback has been enormous. That's why I wanted to leave a window in whatever it may to be able to take advantage of the enhancement. So I genuinely welcome if you folks download this thing and take a look at it and have ideas on how it could be a more useful, usable, tool, uh, I am wide open for suggestions. I change that thing every second day. In fact, the date on the one that is on my website today is today's date. Jeff, would you like to share your uh, presentation? Yeah, why not? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just a thought. Just a thought. Okay. Yeah, okay, good. Can everyone see that? Uh, yes. They will be able to in the buttons in the room now. Okay, Simon's saying yes. So everyone in the room can see it? We're okay. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, okay. All right, great. So um, 
so the only reason I'm here is because of Bob and Anthony. Uh, <laughs> because about four and a bit years ago, it feels like so long ago that God was a boy. Um, I, I was working at Sustainability Think Tank and Consultancy in London uh, that John Elkington founded, the guy who came up with the term triple bottom line. Um, and I've been working with companies and getting really frustrated with helping companies get better on things like Dow Jones Sustainability Index and realizing it wasn't taking them in the right direction. And I'd been, I came across the natural step stuff and, and I thought, God, yes, we've got to be measuring progress toward the future. How on earth are we going to do that? Um, I'd been out trying to get some seed funding to do that, realizing that trying to do it within a consultancy wasn't going to work. This had to be open source and free and stuff. And I spoke to a colleague of mine um, who I knew would be sympathetic to the idea, um, Lorraine Smith, from uh, who some of you may know. She's originally from Toronto. Um, yeah, she's presenting, and, next, she's presenting next month. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, that will be an excellent one. Get the popcorn ready for that one. Um, so, so Lorraine said, yeah, this sounds great. You've got to go and look at this blog that Bob Willard has just written. And I said, who's Bob Willard? And I went and looked at this blog on this gold standard benchmark for truly sustainable business. And it was, it was as if Bob had read my mind and I thought, bugger, someone's already doing this. <laughs> and then about, about three seconds later, I thought, actually, that's fantastic. I'm not mad. And here's people who really know what they're doing. Um, and so I, uh, I spoke to my uh, then, well, before he, my kind of business partner, this Martin, my kind of co-conspirator, because we were still trying to get funding and start the thing. Uh, and we hadn't quite at that point uh, set up as a non-profit uh, officially. But I said to him, look, what are we going to do about this? Um, and we decided, well, it can't hurt to call you guys up. So called Chad Hart, the executive director of Natural Step Canada. And Chad, to his credit, rather than saying, you know, don't worry, we've got this in hand, thanks, but no thanks, said, okay, we'll fly you over to Toronto. You, you need to be part of this workshop we're hosting. So I took a week off work um, and flew out to Toronto. Um, and basically it was uh, such an obvious meeting of minds um, that, I got back from Toronto and immediately quit the day job, um, which seemed like an incredibly good idea at the time. I, I think after the seventh month of no wages, it was starting to feel like less of a good idea. <laughs> but anyway, wind the clock forward, and uh, that's no longer a problem. And we seem to be making some reasonable progress. Um, so what I'm going to do now is briefly share with you uh, what our overall vision is, then talk to you about where we're up to on the content itself, the benchmark and what release one was and how we're now progressing toward release two. And then talking about, I'll talk a little bit about what we're doing to realize the vision beyond just creating another PDF, because that's not going to change the world. Um, so if that all sounds okay, yeah. let's get going. What's our overall vision? So our overall aim is, and this is a pretty ambitious timeline, but within 10 years, all major companies in the world are going to report on their extra financial performance. Um, in line with what system science says, and more specifically toward and beyond an environmental and social break-even point, as credibly, concisely, and comparably as they do today with their financial accounts. Um, our theory of change is that basically until we have companies reporting their true progress toward and beyond a uh, minimum necessary future state, um, we're never going to have um, investors and consumers and others actually um, making decisions that um, steer capital and revenue and so forth towards those companies who really are the game changers and who really are trying to get C back on track. So that's what we're trying to do, and that's a pretty ambitious aim. We want to have the world's top 5,000 companies using this within 10 years. Um, given that currently we have about five, uh, that's or at least five that we know about, that is pretty tough. But we like a challenge, and we don't have time to waste, so that's where we're going. So I'll tell you how we're trying to enable that 
turn this into a mass movement in a little while. But first, where are we up to with the benchmark stuff? Actually, any any quick questions on the time? Um, obviously, you can ask any at the end, but I'll uh, get straight into where we're up to with the benchmark then. So it's pretty clear we all know that we need to rethink how we do business, where we are on all these socioeconomic and uh, system natural process dimensions. Um, and to rethink how we do business, we've got to rethink how we value it. I think everyone's pretty much agreed that shareholder value is, you know, long gone as a valid concept where companies just privatize gains at the expense of socializing losses shared value well it sounded like an idea um it it was at least um approachable by the average ceo because it sounded like shareholder um but unfortunately it's been co-opted far too often to mean let's talk about the good stuff and either ignore or, or justify um, the bad, um, you know, by focusing on that good stuff. So when you get British American Tobacco um, coming out with a creating shared value report about how they're, you know, really contributing positively to the world, you've got to you've got to wonder. Um, and of course, we can't look at the good unless we're looking at the um, the bad in context. We need to take a holistic view. So we advocate instead for looking at system value. So businesses addressing these societal challenges, one, in a holistic way, while not hindering progress toward a planned future. So, and this requires a new benchmark. You've probably all seen this before. Um, typically today, we look at and companies report on performance relative to the past year, which doesn't tell you anything useful. Um, relative to other companies in the sector, which only encourages a race to be less bad. Relative to short-term goals, which everybody needs short-term goals, but you know, and, and every journey is a series of steps. But if they're set arbitrarily, usually based on what a company knows it's going to be able to achieve anyway, then that's not exactly taking us in the right direction. So what we need to do is I just understand what this necessary break-even state is so we can measure the gap between where a company is now and where it needs to be. And that's what we call the social and environmental break-even point. And that language resonates quite well, even with CFOs. Um, what we find is that everyone intuitively understands the idea of break-even, that on the financial dimension, you have to make as much money as you spend or you're not going to be around for very long. And yes, you can make a loss for a few years if you've got a really good story about investing for the future, but people will rapidly lose patience if that doesn't come to fruition. And so being able to um, tie that to the triple bottom line and say we've never actually had a clear definition of what social environmental break even works means is a great way to get senior business people on board, at least with the concept. So we start in defining that breaking point with this definition based on John Ehrenfeld's uh, definition of sustainability, um, which is the business creates value while in no way undermining and ideally increasing the possibility that humans and other life will flourish forever. Now the eagle-eyed among you will realize there are two parts to that. The first part is in no way undermining the possibility. So this is what every company must strive to do and the second part is ideally increasing the possibility. Now, in theory, a business could exist as long as it's causing no harm and doing nothing to undermine progress toward a flourishing future. It might not actually be increasing it, but many companies might actively have a purpose which, um, which is specifically to accelerate our transition to a sustainable future. So to tell the whole story, we need to look at both sides of that. And to answer what that actually means, how to operationalize that, we need to realize that every business is part of a complex and interdependent value web. And so it's not as simple as saying, what does a business need to do within its own four walls? Um, so we've got these two sides to this, these two questions. And this has been the one on the left there, what must every company strive to do to ensure it becomes future fit to reach this extra financial break even point? That was the topic we um, focused on for release one, which came out in May 
of last year after two previous public drafts. And the second question, which we're banging our heads against the wall with now, um, is what can a company do in and beyond its pursuit of break even to create system value? So to accelerate the future fitness of other actors within the socioeconomic system. Okay. I'm going to pause for breath. Any immediate thoughts on that stuff? No? Um, the only thing that strikes me um, is the fact that it's true they are part of this uh, network, value network, um, and that systemic change actually would require multiple entities to adjust and change their their value propositions in a co-evolutionary co fashion. Yeah. Um, so so you know the unit of sampling is without doubt the the ecosystem. Um, um, but the unit of analysis, I mean, in, a, in an entrepreneurial way, the unit of analysis would be the individual organization. But in a collaborative approach to sustainable systemic change, we need to look at multiple entities in the value network. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. So one of the things we want to do when time and money allows is actually look at this in terms of a, a kind of um, societal function way. So what would future fit apparel look like, for example? Um, and, you know, what does that mean across the whole value web? Um, what does the future fit transport system look like? Um, so rather than looking just at the um, one company level, we look at things across the whole. The reason we've gone with it at the level of a company and helping a company understand what break even looks like is if we were to in any way say that within your value web, this has got to all somehow balance out, that you don't have to hit break even across all these goals. Immediately, you open a crack which people put a crowbar in and say, ah, well, okay, we'll do well on these ones. We won't worry about those greenhouse gases because someone else can figure out how to capture them because we're not in the business of capturing greenhouse gases. And before you know it, you end up exactly where we are today. So um, our sense is that if we say every company has to hit all of these goals, yeah, absolutely, they may only hit them through collaboration with others in helping them do so, um, and that's fine. But they have to, uh, it, it's up to them to ensure that that goal is hit as a result of their existence in the, uh, in the market. Does that make sense? Jeff, do you want to talk about the timeline for release two? I will do, yes. So I'll get into that. So timeline for release two, um, we're releasing it in September, uh, which is quite a compressed timeline. There's a good reason for that. Um, we have a concept paper on release two. Uh, Anthony, I don't know if you shared that with the group yet. Did I tell you not to? I, might I, I actually didn't in, in the end. I only okay. had some time, but if you'd like to post it to yeah. the LinkedIn, uh, yeah, so okay. All the work to do so. Well, I'll, I'll hold off just because I'm going to make a few tweaks to it. But the concept paper is basically explaining uh, what I'm just about to tell you now and going into quite a lot of detail. So uh, this is like to get some expert feedback while we're still creating the metrics for release two. So let me quickly run through. So our starting point, I'm sure you've all seen this before, the wonderful old natural step diagram um, where the social... Um, system condition here has, as, as many of you know, in the last seven or eight years, uh, led by a, a researcher called Melina Missima over in uh, Bleckinge Institute has, has been, been unpacked into five kind of system conditions uh, to make that much more actionable. So we now have eight system conditions. Uh, the orange one there captures all five of the social ones. Um, and that was our starting point. That's what happens at the system level. But what does that mean for a company? Well, a future fit business in no way contributes to breaches in these system conditions. Okay. What does that mean? Well, going back to the value web, um, you know, the understanding that a company is part of a value web, to reach extra financial break even, you need to not breach the system conditions through your own operational activities. 
to not externalize breaches throughout your supply chain. So, <coughs> excuse me, you can't simply outsource the dirty things like manufacturing or get raw materials from um, companies that use child labor um, because that's not your problem because it's outside your own four walls. That's externalizing breaches and that's not permitted. And the third thing is you do not force breaches through your sales chain by forcing your customers and their customers to breach system missions. So when you get to that point, and it might be a very long journey, particularly for some companies in some sectors, then you will be featured. That's it. Um, now, of course, it's a nice um, high level definition, but what companies really want is to understand, well, how do I operationalize this and make it easy? So we translated it into a set of principles for a business, which is just a one-to-one -one correspondence between the system conditions and principles. Then we translated that by looking at what um, a typical company, in terms of its stakeholder relationships, um, does in terms of selling products and services, having a physical presence, operating in and near communities, relying on suppliers of goods and services, etc. We translated the principles into a set of goals, which together mark the line in the sand that every company must aspire to reach. And then we translated that into a set of metrics, so companies can measure the gap between where they are now and where they need to be. And that was the focus of release one. Okay. So that was released in May of last year, um, and it allows you to measure progress towards all of these break-even goals. Um, but for release two, what we're looking at, in an ideal world, well, let's imagine, right, that today we could wave a magic wand and suddenly every company in the world was future fit. Every company was doing nothing to undermine the integrity of our social fabric or the natural processes we as a species depend upon. Okay. We would still be in pretty bad shape because we've been breaching the system conditions for so long, we've depleted our natural capital, we've eroded trust in institutions and so forth to such a degree that it wouldn't all be you know, sweetness and light tomorrow. So we need to think about actually reversing past breaches, overcoming past breaches, and helping others to avoid future breaches as well. Okay, so system, creating system value is about what an organization does in and beyond its own pursuit of future fitness to help reverse past breaches or help others in its value where to avoid future ones. And there are, you can really think of it through four lenses. The first is you can actually go beyond break even within your own operations. So let's imagine you uh, install renewable energy like, like solar power. Um, and you actually generate more than you use and you make that available to others um, so that they can accelerate their transition to renewable energy. The second thing is increasing the fitness of others in your value web. So for example, you might rely on a supplier that, uh, for an agricultural input. They might be operating in a water scarce region. You might invest in that supplier to enable them to transition to uh, drip irrigation that eliminates their negative water impacts in that water basin. Uh, likewise, on the sales chain side, um, you might enable um, customers to avoid uh, making particular breaches by, for example, replacing a, a toxic chemical that your customers use with a non-toxic version. Then there's value web inclusivity. So um, to overcome the social past breaches in the social system conditions, this is about removing existing structural obstacles to things like health, impartiality, and so on. And this is about uh, inclusivity. This is about access to basic services at the sales side for people in underserved markets. And it's about access to ec um, economic opportunity on the supply side, smallholder farmers, and so on. And then finally, there's broader societal fitness. So actions to improve fitness beyond the core supply and sales chain. <coughs> For example, Nova Nordisk, one of the companies we're working with, a uh, big healthcare company working in the diabetes space, is doing a lot to, um, to um, educate healthcare professionals in rural India and China and other places to both spot and diagnose and treat diabetes, even though they've got nothing to do with selling Nova Nordisk drugs. 
Um, so this is just something they have a lot of know-how about and they're um, increasing capacity in those developing nation healthcare systems um, because they can. Um, and you know, currently they're not monetizing it and so they get no recognition for it through traditional metrics. Uh, Jeff, so, before you, Jeff, before you, you go off that slide, um, and, I, and I'm not sure why didn't, this question didn't occur to me when you were talking about release one because it applies to both. Um, has there been a, any evidence so far that there's a relationship between um, scale, and by scale I'm thinking um, across multiple biomes where there's, you know, real ecological and not, not just ecological but also social biomes and um, the ability for an organization to be either future fit, break even or beyond break even. Have, have we got any evidence to say whether or not that's, um, whether, whether there's a challenge there? What with whether it's even technically possible to reach break even you mean? Yes, for, for example. I mean, if, if you listen to people like the Business Alliance for Local Living Economies as, as one group here in North America, um, and, and B-Lab to a certain extent because they don't yet certify, uh, have, a, have a, a mechanism for certifying larger companies, um, there would seem to be those people out there who would say that above a certain scale, you actually can't meet certain system conditions because you're basically looking to be efficient um, across multiple biomes, whether they be ecological or social, when in fact you need an effectiveness approach which would undermine economic efficiency goals. Um, interesting question. Um, I think if, uh, yeah, go on. I mean, if you're talking about scale and you're saying that large can't. Uh, no, I'm not I, saying large can't. I'm asking if there been any evidence so far about whether or not that type of, that may or may not be true. I'm not making an assertion. I mean, I, I, I'm going to put out there at my risk uh, Walmart because I think that as a large organization, especially in my area, they have made a better case uh, for product. Um, because of their scale. So I'll give you an example about their cotton t-shirt. When they understood and they changed the inputs and changed the U.S. farmers of cotton to organic fields, they underwrote that process and was able to uh, create an impact um, across the system. But in part, uh, a decade ago, when I heard industry say to me that uh, Walmart is forcing us to do an audit, they were offering that to their supply chain. So right now in their journey, they, they've, been, they've been at the table and working on this. They are well ahead of many companies because of their size and scale. I'm not quite sure if I understand your scale uh, issue. Lots of companies like me, I, I couldn't make that impact because I don't have that leverage that Walmart has. But, so maybe I misunderstood the question. Well, so, so, so there's, there's no doubt that if you look at the other available benchmarks, so comparing to others, comparing to the best practice, that it, it's possible for organizations of all sizes to make different impact. The, the, there's, um, the, 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 the question is, can you be future fit and a global company? Um, yeah, okay. So, so I think I get what you mean, and, and I, yeah, I, I take that comment. Sorry, I'm not sure who, who made that comment. There's a very good comment about Walmart. I, th I think, can you be a future global corporation in an economic system that is fundamentally broken um, and rewards the pursuit of dollars um, at the expense of all else? No, you can't. Um, can all global global corporations pursue future fitness in such a way that over time the system as a whole becomes future fit? Yes, I think so. So, you know, we're working with the body shop, for example, on becoming, you know, and they've said that within 40 years they expect 
to be, no, within 25 years, by 2040, they expect to be completely future fit across their entire value chain, right? Um, but they know that 25 years is actually incredibly ambitious for that um, because the system is stacked against them. Um, so what we're looking at here, you know, I mentioned that our 10 year vision was that every company is reporting progress toward and beyond break even. I would be amazed if within 10 years, any company is remotely close to break even across their entire value chain. But the point is, we will be on a trajectory towards that, that and um, investors, consumers, and others will at least be getting the signals to know how to steer their capital towards those organizations that are taking us in the right direction. So, do you want to chime in with your comment and then Stephen in the room here? Yeah, hi, Jeff, and hi, everyone. Sorry, we, uh, apologies, we've had some technical issues today. I think I really like the previous slide in, you know, in terms of the narrative going from the global conditions to the metrics. Just one of my comments here, and I think this is very positive. We're really seeing here in Brazil, some of the largest companies, they now really recognize that they actually need systems thinking skills. They're, they're not quite at the stage of introducing systemic measures and metrics. And the reason is because uh, some actually very senior leaders, CEOs, presidents that are very influential, they have recognized that there's a lack of systemic thinking. So when you use the language, oh, we need a systemic measure, a lot of people in the rest of these companies, and we're talking very big conglomerates, they, they don't really understand what that means at all. But on the very positive side, I think a lot of our work with Polynomics sorry, Holonomics Education, it really complements this because we're la uh, laying the, the groundwork to then um, introduce uh, the tools and, and tell people about these excellent initiatives, you know, like the Future Fit Goals and the Flourishing Canvas. And we, what we're finding is that once we do lay a few, um, you know, do some workshops on what exactly systems thinking is, then it really makes people receptive and um, I think that's really interesting here. People really do want to know more, but they can't instantly grasp exactly what it would mean in terms of operationalizing. We have to do a bit of work before um, really going into the metrics. Yeah. So this is more consistent. Yeah. More consistent is evolving. So it evolves with the, you know, if you have enough critical mass, of large companies actually trying to be yeah. breaking even and so on. Gotcha. And suddenly, you know, it will change. And uh, you can see that, for example, with the EBAC investment. Ten years ago, you know, people laughed about it. Now you have big investment coming all about impact investment and you have your own indexes, investment indexes and so on. You can follow on the stock exchanges, etc. So it, it adapts to to you know what people are doing, it reflects what doing, so it evolves. Yes, but here's the deep, deep irony. So, Bob, you presented the results from that Bain paper at the start. And in that Bain paper, it talks about Nestle and their pledge to reduce water withdrawals per ton of product by 40% compared to 2005 levels. And so by 2015, they actually accomplished that at 41.2. Now, Nestle ranks number one in the food, beverage, and tobacco category of Dow Jones Sustainability Index. And this is the same company that is practicing fresh water again across the, across the world. So, so it, <laughs> it's, it's, you know, from in the current state system, that's the standard for sustaining sustainability. But so the future fit benchmark is so desperately needed and so desperately needs to replace what's currently there. But how the, ad the adoption curve is going to be the key, right? How, how do we get the how do we move this up the adoption curve, Jack? How do we accelerate? Yeah. yeah, good question. Let's move on to that. So, so release two will uh, mirror release one in the sense that there's system value principles, system value types, and then system value metrics, um, and then. Tying it all together is a is a set of credible a set of um, simple 
for reporting guidelines and scorecard templates that will enable future fit performance and progress to be articulated in a credible, concise, and compatible way. And that, that's really part part of that question should move on. We work with a number of companies in close learning partnerships um, to help us understand what needs to happen and how this how to make this benchmark as useful and usable as possible. Uh, one of the one of the key ones there is Grant Thornton uh, and I'll explain why. Um, so it really enables you or will do with release two to do two to do three things. First, steer towards towards the point at which you're causing no harm. Second, um, identify opportunities to address systemic challenges while avoiding unforeseen trade-offs in support of the success, in other words, creating system value. And then thirdly, communicate about this effectively, whether it's internally to get employee buy-in on why they're doing stuff, or whether it's externally to investors and others to really articulate the fact that this company is doing something different. Um, so that's the benchmark itself, but that's no good if no one ever uses the bloody thing. So what is our world transformation plan? Okay. So for this to succeed and have any meaningful impact, our belief is that companies need a useful and usable tool that empowers them to self-assess their progress towards and ultimately beyond this extra financial break-even point. Part of the problem with existing metrics is, as, as was just said, um, likes of DGSI is sending completely the wrong signals about who's actually leading. You know, when, it, when the DGSI tells you an oil company is 87% sustainable, I want to start throwing furniture around the room. Um, so we need, part of the problem is that we're sending the wrong signals. The, the other part of the problem is it's death by questionnaire. Um, one FMCG company told me recently that it took them, they calculated it took them 1,800 person hours to collect the data to fill in the questionnaire last year. That's not helping anyone, anyone, right? So we need a self-assessment tool that companies can use themselves. The second point is this tool must be free to use. Otherwise, even if it's just $100, it becomes yet another thing you're trying to sell to people. It's amazing the power of free. I know Bob agrees with this, and we're all in violent agreement over this stuff, that if you want rapid adoption, you need to make stuff free. Um, the third thing is, self-assessment's great, but if you really want to use this to communicate to the world, how can we trust anything you say as a company? Um, so we need to enable independent assurance and easy publication of your performance towards your future fit fitness. Um, so this is exactly the model companies use in the financial sense right now. Companies manage all of their own financial information. It feeds into every decision they make and they track it on a daily, hourly basis. Um, but when it comes time to publish their accounts, they have to get in an independent assurer to validate what they've done before they're, they can publish it to the world. Um, so that's um, something we're working on too. And then finally, we only want to stay as a small organization working on the core IP and the, and the core tools and enable an ecosystem of partners that can um, help us get this adopted at speed and scale. And I get at least one or two a week requests from organizations or individuals around the world saying, how can we partner with you? Um, that's what we need to do to uh, drive up adoption and how we're doing it. First, the independent data assurance. So we're working with Grant Thornton, which is the world's sixth biggest auditor slash accountant slash assurer, to build a future fit assurance model. Um, we we announced this back at New Metrics in October uh, in, here in Austin, um, and we just kicked off that work stream last week. And it's I never thought I would be excited spending an afternoon in a room full of accountants, and last week I was proved wrong. Uh, really good stuff this and uh, the great news is that Grant Thornton will uh, understand that this is not a competitive advantage for them um, yes they want to be in at ground level yes they want to be seen as the people that helped us do this but this is going to be published free for any registered order to, to use whether it's KPMG PwC and so on second one is my co-founder Martin Rich um, 
was 12 years an investment banker, managed to move back from the dark side, um, worked six years in the social impact, impact investment space, structuring and selling social impact bonds, uh, realized that you know although that was making a difference, it really wasn't influencing mainstream capital as fast as it should be. So he kind of came at this from the other side that I was, and we both realized we were trying to do the same thing. So he's been knocking on all the doors of the pension funds and the banks about you know, what do you need and how can we get this information to you and do you understand you're completely open to systemic risks because you're only looking within sectors rather than across sectors and so on. Um, <coughs> and the response has been unanimous. All of these institutional investors want this stuff, but they all say it's no use to us until we can get the data. So we've got a partnership with Sustainalytics, which is the world's second largest provider of ESG data to institutional investors. Um, they have over 300 data points for each of the world's top 4,000 companies. In fact, I think it's near 5,000, um, based on existing um, non-financial data disclosures. Now, obviously, that data isn't perfect, but what we're doing is applying a future fit lens to look at the systemic impact based on company business models so that we can start weighting the um, respective um, scores of those companies within Sustainalytics investor uh, dashboard um, according to their um, susceptibility to systemic risks and their openness to capturing systemic opportunities. So it's a kind of proxy future fit assessment, which at least gives institutional investors a way to start embracing this kind of approach and thinking beyond best in class. Um, and then as we get companies self-reporting and getting their data independently assured, that will be added in to this database in a way that's highlighted in a different color or a different logo or something with a view to um, any institutional investor seeing companies that are highlighted will think, ah, okay, I can really trust this because this is based on real data, not proxy. So we're hoping to have something ready for investors to start using before the end of 2018. Um, we're also, we've also had a number of companies approach us. Obviously, we're working with a handful, but we've had hundreds of people download the benchmark. Actually, it's, it's probably way more than that now. I haven't checked recently. It's anecdotally come up to me at conferences and stuff and say, oh, we've been using your stuff internally to help our CEO understand that we haven't got an answer to this issue or that issue, whatever. Um, a number of companies have gone in touch and said, well, how can we get involved? How can we show that we're pursuing future fitness? So we're coming up with a future fit pledge. Any company can take. Um, excuse me, which will require them to report on their progress at least annually. We'll have a special member hub of our website where they can do so and where anyone can go and look at these performance declarations. There'll be a modest annual fee for membership, but we're, we would rather get hundreds of dollars from thousands of companies than the other way around. This is all about achieving scale and just helping us keep the lights on in the meantime. Um, and then uh, finally, partner training and accreditation. So. Um, if we want an ecosystem of partners, we've got to make sure those partners know what, know what they're doing. Anyone can, in theory, download the benchmark today and go and bang on someone's door and offer consulting services around it, whatever they want to do. But if they wish to say that they're an approved partner um, and they know what they're doing, they will have to go through training and accreditation and uh, we're hoping to develop that program and get it off the ground pretty soon, hopefully with, the, uh, with a large amount of input and expertise from the various natural step groups around the world. Um, so that, uh, yes, that hopefully goes some way to addressing that question about how do we actually scale this stuff up. Uh, it's certainly not the final answer. We're kind of making this up as we go along to a degree, but hopefully we're putting in place the right pieces to uh, you know, at least catalyze a movement around this. Any questions? Okay. Uh, yeah, okay. I'm just, uh, I, I might have to stop screen sharing. I'm, it's not letting me see my Adobe window.
Oh, here we go. Okay, so as businesses stretch themselves to become future fit, they have to think and act holistically, which takes them far outside of it. Yes, part of the solution will be found through partnerships. Yes, will often be more focused on environmental social profits near the end integration of the zone of value generations. Non profit sector also needs to move into middle zone of value generation. Is this part of your vision? <coughs> Excuse me, of the potential for future fit? Uh, I'm not entirely sure I understand what you mean about moving into the middle zone of value generation. Do you mean we should start to focus on becoming profitable ourselves or we should start to help companies think about becoming profitable or something else? Are there any other questions while Douglas? Um, that, yeah. Okay. I, uh, okay, it's been it's been a, a long question. Um, yes, Tanya. Well, I I guess I just see that um, the the for profit world is really focused on trying to transform itself, and it is moving into areas that it previously largely ignored, both social and environmental um, concerns. Okay. But our economy is, or or our society has been built into this uh, structure that has bifurcated um, um, organizations into for-profit and not-for-profit. And the not-for-profits are always the poor cousins. And um, and they've relied upon money <coughs> shuffled over from uh, for-profit businesses. But it just seems to me that um, in, in any future, the not-for-profit world is going to end up being somewhat displaced by the movement of the for-profit world. And so is there a way that, that both sides of this, uh, of, our, of our organizational sort of infrastructure um, uh, can be working simultaneously towards common goals? Um, because I think they, okay. there's an implicit um, rationale or, or reasonableness to that. Yeah, okay. Well, I, I think it's crazy that we, it's understandable given the way our economic systems are built up, but I think it's crazy that we have a distinction between not-for-profit and for-profit organizations. Um, everything should be about for impact. And, you know, some things that are for impact will generate enough money just to keep their own lights on. Some will generate enough money that they can pay their shareholders something extra. Um, but really, it should be a continuum. But where we are today, of course, we're limited by the infrastructure in place. So <coughs> we're a non-profit, um, partly because it sends the right message to the world that we are not trying to get money out of you, that we are delivering a public good, and that's still very much a perception. Partly because that opens up foundation funding to us that would otherwise, you know, the, the number of foundations you go to who've got hundreds of millions of dollars ready to put into you know good projects but the first question if you if you say we're a for-profit company you may as well forget answering the rest of the questionnaire um i think as we move forward that's going to change i think the b corp movement is helping to change perceptions around you know it's, it's not it's not about doing good or making money it can be both uh, but i think there is it's going to take a while before this all um, comes out in the wash. I mean, I've been asked a number of times, why aren't you guys a B Corp? Well, we love the B Corp movement. Um, we, we know them well. We're, we've worked with them on a number of things. But actually, I can't become a B Corp because I'm a non-profit. You know, you, they don't have a way of certifying non-profits, which is kind of nuts, but you can understand their focus where they are. Um, so I think over time, we will see this boundary blur to the point at which you know, the benefit corporation model that B-Lab promote, for example, where it's kind of a new legal entity where it's baked into the constitution of the company um, at a legal level that they pay attention to environmental and social as well as uh, financial constraints, I think, will become the norm. But for now, um, that's, yeah, that's not the case. And for now, I'm quite happy that we've been lucky enough to receive foundation funding um, to kickstart what we're doing until we get enough membership and partnership fees that we can keep the lights on ourselves.
and and that's that makes total sense to me my my own background is in the cultural sector and i see the potential of museums um uh right. to, to actually become a, a fairly critical uh part of a um a community engagement process in which change of worldviews um the cultural values are actually um um shaped in some ways not not in a uh a machiavellian kind of way but rather um through creating the dialogues um where these issues can come out and and begin to change because i just am not sure that for profit com uh, companies yeah. have the leverage to be able to do that across the the whole of the culture yeah i i i agree i think we're already starting to see how warped um things get with the universities, right? I mean, the, even some of the more esteemed universities in the UK, <coughs> excuse me, are now offering a far limited, far more limited range of courses because they know they're the ones they can charge top dollar for because that's the only way they can keep their lights on. So they're turning into for-profit companies that are going where the money is. Um, and we need to, if we're gonna change this, we need to redefine, if you think of Donella Meadows, you know, points to intervene in a system. Right. Um, you know, at the moment, the, the entire problem we've got is that at the purpose of the system level, it's about maximizing dollars. It's yes. about GDP, right? And everything flows out of that to the point that, you know, company, sorry, governments spend all their time and central banks spend all their time fiddling with nonsense like interest rates to kickstart growth or slow down inflation or whatever it is by right, tweaking these little dials, all in service of this great God GDP. Um, if we can change, and it's a very big if, and it's a very difficult one to change, but if we can change how the system as a whole thinks about value, then so much of this other stuff will come out in the wash. We, w we will see these things emerge um, seemingly of their own accord through the various and, and many weak, constraints that are starting to steer things in the right direction in pursuit of this new idea of system value versus dollars. Um, and then I think that it, the system as a whole will start to recognize the value of institutions like museums, like universities and others in ways that now today seem inconceivable. At least that's my hope. I, if, I didn't, if I didn't believe that was possible, I would have already run for the hills. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so we just have a couple of minutes left. Penny, I'll just is your question quick or a, a comment or should be quick. it should be quick. Go ahead. Uh, I guess one of the central problems here and maybe the future benchmark, but I'm not sure, the valuation. And I'm not sure how you evaluate sustainability because you're talking about break even. And for example, in Bob's case, before when we were talking about the company, everything translated into dollars and it's pretty straightforward, it's nice, it's simple. So how do you do valuation? My guess is from what I understand, you have some performance scoring that is then compared to the benchmark that I guess is constantly moving or something. I'm, I'm not sure. So and I can not, you know, few other points, but forget it. Yeah, we don't have to um, maybe so just like to comment on valuation. Clear uh, of trying to jet, ascribe any kind terms. of dollar amount to any social or environmental impact. Um, I think it's very counterproductive. There's a lot of good work being done to value natural capital and so forth. Um, but I, I spoke to one investor once. This will give you an idea of how, <coughs> excuse me, counterproductive that can be. I was speaking to one investor once talking about the environmental profit and loss that Puma came up with. You probably all know about, you know, they calculated that they had were 140 million euros in deficit based on this EPNL. Um, one investor said to me, well, then they've done a fantastic job of externalizing costs to make sure I still get a dividend. And you think that that's what we're looking at if we start to make it look like natural capital and dollars are interchangeable, right? So we, we've avoided that. We think of this as metrics that steer progress, that help you show your performance relative to others in the system in a way that can meaningfully influence stakeholder behavior. Um, but we stop short of the dollars, and this break-even point won't move. 
we're not measuring best practice such that as every company improves, that line in the sand moves. Uh, what will get better is our ability to measure progress toward the break-even state as better ways to capture data become available, for example. Um, but And, and there's, there's more traceability throughout value chains. But the line in the sand itself won't change. So um, we, I, I do want to honor our 6 o'clock finish time, not least because it's Valentine's Day today and a number of us have to leave. Um, uh, Simon, did, did your comment, did you have a comment or a question? No, sure, yeah, it's, it's really quick. Uh, basically, here in Brazil, in obviously, you know, there's a huge amount of societal um, inequality. Um, but also in Brazil, there are a number of extremely large companies that are privately owned. They're family owned organizations, but they're huge. And one of the problems is that a lot of these families, they do want to invest in social programs, uh, health, education, programs for children. But the big question is that they're never really too sure that the money they're investing is having an impact. So to keep this short, um, I'd love to drop uh, Jeffy an email about this because you know a lot of some of these families they're getting in touch with me and myself saying what are the metrics and how can we really start to measure this impact systemically so this is more of a comment i really appreciate okay. you, that it's you know late for you guys maybe i'd love to stay in touch just drop yeah. an email and maybe just chat about this further and how we can do some testing yeah. of the metrics yeah the please do and i think um we got a potential way into something called the Global Family Business Network the other day. And apparently there's like thousands of these family owned businesses of various sizes that are all part of this network. And who in theory, all should be A, less susceptible to the whims of, of shareholders, and B, care very much about the legacy they're leaving behind them. So I think that's a great sweet spot for us to try and get some traction in. Yeah, and absolutely. Here in Brazil, you know, there are a lot of political problems, but there are some really yeah. strong potential initiatives with good people at the top of Brazilian society. But they're coming to Maria and I saying, look, we just need a bit of help okay, with this. Great. So, I'd love to... so I, I look forward to that being the topic of uh, the next update from uh, Jeff and uh, Bob to hear about how all of their uh, uh, progress towards achieving the, the grand visions that they've shared that I think we all share. Uh, and I want to thank you both for taking the time today to, to give us the latest update and uh, appreciate it very much. The slides are already in our Dropbox. The recording uh, will be there very shortly um, and the URL for the recording will also be in the comments on the post. Go back to that as well. So thank you both very much. Next month uh, we have Lorraine Smith from Volans uh, presenting on uh, the recent work they've done on specifically on business breakthrough business models, uh, and so that's going to be uh, a good talk. And the following month uh, we have uh, Nancy Boken, who is a long-time member, uh, giving us an update on her work on uh, on values and value, uh, and uh, I think that should be of interest to many of us here as well. Thank you, everybody, again. Uh, happy Valentine's Day. Thanks, and, guys. Uh, right. See Thanks you on the same back channel, the same back place next month. Bye. Bye.